Matthew chapter 14. We didn't actually get to finish it last week. And uh, we got more into exaltation, although we have many points to give. We're talking about goal setting for success. Matthew 14. And we have said a few things how when we set our goals, we need our spirits, our souls and our bodies to get involved. If only your spirit is involved and your soul is not involved, you will not succeed because you will need the emotional strength to carry on with the goal that you have set. And then if you have set goals by your soul and your spirit is not in it, then God is not involved in it. And if God is not involved in it, all you have is your own strength. You will never be able to fulfill it. Besides that, we said that when we set a goal, we need to realize that it will be, there will be a sacrifice involved to achieve a goal. We do not receive something for nothing. Once you set a goal, ready, you want to be the best piano player in the world. It will mean you have to sacrifice your playtime now. It will mean you have to sacrifice and not your, your spare time, your leisure time. There will be a lot of things to sacrifice in order to achieve your goal. And uh, we realize that there are too many people going about with no, no goals. And without goals, you cannot succeed. God has made us human beings with a vision. And goal setting is a part and parcel of our ability to visualize and actualize what we are able to conceive. Now in this series, you will notice that we stress particularly on goal setting in the area of success, natural success and achievement. That is because we have through other areas of teaching uh, emphasize spiritual growth and uh, spiritual goals in that area. So we are not wanting to repeat ourselves. In this series, if you are hearing this series and you are saying, hey, you know, it's talking about natural success alone per se, well, that's because there are so many other topics we have thought on and uh, I believe it's an area that we need to touch on and emphasize so that natural success brings us the ability to have more time for spiritual pursuit. You ask any Tom, Dick and Harry in the street, it's very important whether they get their next meal. It's very important whether they can get the next payment for their house, whether they could pay the rent, whether they could <coughs> make ends meet for their children, for themselves. It's very important to the person on the street. And it's very important to the average Christian. And if you don't set goals, we will not be able to succeed. So we're going to talk about some natural goals that we need to set. Let me give you an example of an analysis that I have done. Uh, in people's lives. Even if you start working from the age of 21, and if, suppose, supposedly, that you have a goal to have to retire, let's say, at 55 or 60, that would mean that you only have about 35 years to gather whatever you need to gather to have a reasonable retirement. Now when I talk about retirement, I explain it later. Retirement, there is no retirement in God. But rather you retire from earning a living. You establish yourself in a natural so that you could at the age of 55, even if you're not called into full time, pursue spiritual things. Don't you think that's a nice goal? Rather than work, eat, live, earn, work, eat, live, earn until the grave. And you've got no time for spiritual pursuit. We know that in this life, spiritual things are vitally important for us to achieve. Because those are eternal. You could earn millions of dollars in the natural, but have nothing in the spirit. When you die, it all finishes. When you have spiritual treasures that you lay up after you die and you go to heaven, you have a lot of eternal rewards. And I think that will be more satisfied. But those things are not going to come automatically. We need to take goals. Even now, remember these goals that we're talking about. The goals that you set when you have a call to the ministry are different when you have no call. Basically, we are talking about goals of those who need not, do not have a call to the ministry. And the vast majority of Christians are in those areas. They need to learn to set goals. 
without goals. There are too many people going about without goals. They just get to work and they're happy with it. What happens is they are short-sighted. They are like a bat without a radar in an old stinky cave. The cave is the cave of the world. And suddenly, it hits them at the age of 50. Hey, I didn't prepare what will happen after 55. It's too late. Or perhaps they're just working, working and working and getting things by. As long as I got food on the table and a roof over my head, now I don't want to think about the future. That's foolishness. That's not the way God planned for His children to live. And on the other side, you have a group of super spiritual cooks who say, Jesus is coming, brother. His coming is near. Implying you don't have a plan for your life now. Implying now all you have to do is adorn yourself with a white robe and live from hand to mouth, expecting his coming any second. What happens if it doesn't come in 20 years? <laughs> you regret. Even though Jesus' coming is imminent and could be at any time, there is no excuse for living a life that is not planned. It's just an excuse for pure laziness. An excuse for living a life that's not planned. So remember that even if you start working at 21 and you have a goal of retirement to, after you retire to go into spiritual pursuit, you've got only 35 years to achieve it. If your goal setting is only two years ahead, that's too short. If your goal setting is five years ahead, that's, well, no can do. If your goal setting is 15 years, that is very good. If your goal setting is set right up to the time you go to meet a savior, that's excellent, par excellent. That's what we want to teach on goal setting. We need long-range goals. We are not here for the short haul. Short haul. We are here for the long haul. We are here for the long marathon race. Not just for the 100 meter death. That's where goal setting comes in. Let's start with where most people start. It, we are going to use uh, the exchange rate that is today and the standard of living that is the cost of living that is present today. You cannot compare with it 10 years or 15 years ago. 15 years ago, earning $500 was equivalent to our days of 2000, right? So you cannot compare. So my uh, comparison now is based on 1991, the decade of the 90s, our cost and standard of living. If right now you're earning between zero to five hundred dollars, your goal should be different from one who earns above five thousand. If you're earning between five hundred to a thousand dollars, then you are more capable of different goals. If you're earning between one thousand to two thousand, uh, or one thousand, two thousand, then you have different goals. Two thousand to three thousand, different goals. Three thousand to four thousand, different goals. Five thousand and above, you are able to achieve different goals. Now, if your capacity for income is only between zero to five hundred, one of your goals should be to up it to two thousand. Not by hook and by crook, but by work and by prayer. Say, brother, I'm just satisfied with $500, wait till the inflation catches up with you in 10 years' time. And your annual increase is about $5 per annum. You will not survive, my friend. You will always be living from hand to mouth if you have no goals. If you're going to work that way until you're 55, you will regret. You say, but God will prosper me. I give my tithes and offering. Yes, God prospers you through yourself. <laughs> The work of your hands, your goal setting. You cannot just say, I give up my tithes and offering and lay down on your couch and sleep. What you will be in five and ten years' time depends on the goals you set today. The visions that you have today, what you are today depended on what you had, uh, had goals and visions five years or ten years ago. So let's examine very carefully. Most people fall into the slot of zero to thousand. The average person, based on our average Malaysian income. Now, if you are zero to five hundred, then it depends on whether you're a family person or you're single. If you're a family person, you have to set your goals to break the two thousand dollar mark. 
We're talking about natural growth. Otherwise, you cannot survive. You cannot blame God. Faith is what you can believe for. If you believe for nothing, you get what you believe. <laughs> nothing. Then if you're 0 to 500, and if you're single, your goals are also different. Slightly different. What goals can a person set? Right? If you look at yourself, you say, Hey, I'm earning 0 to 500 dollars a month. That's all I'm earning. What can I do to achieve more? You have to invest. After all your tithes and offerings, you have to invest in your own education. The world goes by paper degree, so you go for paper degree. You say, but I can't study, then go for a skill in an area. Or you go to develop your skills in direct selling or some other area. You have to set goals. You have zero to 500. If you don't set goals in 35 years time when you retire, you find that perhaps you reach about 700 and by that time inflation has eaten most of it and you find that you're struggling. If you're zero to $500, you will, no, you will most probably now at this time not be owning a house nor your flat. You're either staying with your parents or you're renting a tiny little room and you're surviving. Praise God. We pray that the spiritual super pseudo spiritual cooks don't get you and say, don't bother about all those natural things, just think about heaven. Oh, heaven will come one day. Right? That one day may be a long way off. <laughs> no. Let's be practical. Let's apply the scriptures. Set goals. You have to set goals right now. Get an education if you didn't get an education when you were small. Uh, look into that. Spend your spare time. Invest in it. So that you could upgrade yourself. I would think that reasonably in our terms today, if you're going to raise a family, an income of at least about 2000 will be comfortable. An income of 1000 to 1005 actually is just can get along. That's the standard and cost of living today. So we have to set a goal to break the 2000 mark. That is where I would say that is a comfortable mark. It's, can, you can live comfortably. You know, with a lot of excess and here and there a lot of room to do a lot of things. And God may inspire of you. Go for mission trips. You could pay for yourself. And do a lot of things. Right? Not at the area of barely get along street. We're talking about Prosperity Avenue. How to move house to Prosperity Avenue. Goal setting. Most people are still at Old Kent Road. That's the first part of your Monopoly game. <laughs> right? So... We have <coughs> goal setting for those 0 to 500. Don't set any goals to buy any apartments or houses yet. You are not able. You are not able. Those are not the goals that you are supposed to set now. Right? Perhaps long range goals, right? But long range goals cannot be clear at the moment because you must get through those areas first. Set goals that you, are, you can reach now. You could forever be dreaming of owning your apartments at Vision Heights. You never set a goal and you all be dreams, castles in the air. They will be washed by the first wave that comes. So you zero to 500 and your family person set goals to break the $2,000 mark. Whether it means that you got to increase your educational level, whether it means that you got to explore new means of income, direct selling, sales on it, those areas, whichever. Then for those with zero to five hundred income, they will need to set goals or what I call congregate together. In other words, if, if uh, the father is working, the mother is working, they're zero to five hundred, then their children have grown and they're working, then they can pool their resources together. Where as a total family unit, their income is at least 2,000 plus, then you could do some things that those that are earning there could do, which we're going to read after that, right? We're going to say, you could set the same goals as a family unit that those who are earning 2,000 plus could set. If you're earning between 500 to 1,000 and you're single, most probably you could afford a very low cost apartment. There is one side goal you could set. Don't dream of a double-story ter ter double terrace house yet. Live within your means. Don't let the red rays be upon you. 
Doesn't matter, people get into debt. You say, but other people do it. They earn four figures. Today, four figures is nothing. Four figures could be one zero zero zero. Because at that stage, you may still not be able to afford a double story terrace house yet. Say, but everybody likes it. Yes, who doesn't like it? Who doesn't like a mansion? Right? But we have to learn to live within our means. Don't get caught up with the red race. Set your own goals. While others are paying through their nose, through their ears, losing their arm and leg trying to pay for their house. You could live reasonably, comfortably with your low cost flat until you build your income up further. Now, between zero to one thousand, your goal should still be to up your income to two thousand. In other words, you have to think of ways and ideas from the Lord how the Lord wants you to do it. It could be an education, achieve it, get it, direct selling. Oh, and then that all the other laws of tithing, offering and savings should be applied and you build it up if you're single and you're earning zero to one thousand you're reasonably comfortable most probably you are now worth, you are now living in a rented room or with your parents and let me tell you if you don't set goals now when you are 30, in 30 years' time, you'll still be living your parents and at the most, you'll be earning 1,005. And still at the same educational level. And you'll be looking at yourself saying, Hey, now I'm 49. Shall I go to school, brother? Never too late. Never too late. Take a language course. There are many types of courses you can explore. I'm just giving you hints that we need to set goals. Otherwise, we'll get nowhere. you got only 35 years even if you start working at 21. Unless you... Unless you're not prepared to retire to for spiritual pursuit. If you then you could set a goal, right? If your general income is about thousand, you could begin to do some savings and you could begin to explore low cost housing. It is reachable when your income is about thousand and you have a family and perhaps another one or two of your family members are working. Now I'm talking about corporate account, total account, that means the whole family. Right? A very, very low cost flat. That will be comfortable. You will have enough food on the table, enough money, you know, a, li- a little savings in a bank that you have, the cheaper side, living reasonably comfortably. Without, you know, getting into debt to pay for a, a double story house and losing one of your arms. Set realistic goals. If you want to, let those things come later. Own your own low cost apartment. Then later, by the time you increase your ability to earn, then you'll be able to move into that. Don't jump. Faith is a walk, not a jump. But set goals for that. I will encourage you to set goals. Because the time is coming when, when tenants should be in a losing position. And there's, and there's nothing like owning your own home. And where you don't have to rent it. Whether it's better to own your tiny little flat than to be staying in a better house that you're renting. It's much better. I would think so. By the time you retire, all your children are grown up and then you really decide to live by faith, at least you've got your tiny little apartment there. You could sell it and, and, and go into the mission field if you want. You've got a lot of things you could do with. Let me tell you, those who own houses now set goals long ago. Not by accident. Right? Zero to one thousand. Those are some goals that you set. One thousand to two thousand. If that's your income level, you should be able to set different goals. Education still comes in. There's nothing like intellectual soul development. That means you've got more money to spend on courses that are more expensive. And areas, education costs money. They're investment in yourself. You are your own collateral. You invest in your own mental development, your own skill. So that you will be able to achieve and do a better job in the future. Let me tell you, even if you have 30 years experience working in the same company, another bright spark comes fresh, graduate, with two years experience, comes in, they will overtake you. To the senior managerial, managerial position. Why? Because this is the world we live in. No matter how clever you are, how smart you are, but you cannot prove it on a piece of paper. The world won't recognize you. So don't let that piece of paper prevent you from achieving. Don't let examination fear take you. All things are possible to him who 
to him who believes. And all things are not possible to him who fears. If you are earning between one thousand to two thousand dollars, you, if you're a family person, you could live in a better type of apartment after paying all income tax, tithes, offerings, and placing some savings. Don't ever neglect savings, say that they are important. Then you could be investing in your children, the education. If you're single, you've got much more room to move. In other words, if you're single and earning between $1,000 to $2,000, if right now you don't have a huge savings, there's something wrong. You're a spendthrift. No girls. You earn, you spend. You earn, you spend. You say, I live life for now. Yes, wait till you're 55. And you regret. Don't follow the world. When the, when the world brings their first big paycheck, they will squander it. Don't follow the ways of the world. So if you're $1,000 to $2,000, you have to invest in a savings and in your education. And most probably, if you're that category, you could own your own little apartment. Well, even whether you're single, brother or sister, you could, earn, you could own your own little apartment. They don't cost that much today. And, and most probably, you're either renting a room that costs you between $150 to $250, which would be with just another little bit more the equivalent payment for a nice little apartment. Think about that. And you may be staying there for five years. You've been working in a company. But because you didn't have goals, you didn't have plans, you are still where you are when you started. It makes a difference when you plan your life. Once you pass a 2,000 mark, 2,000 to 3,000, you could have bigger goals. By 2,000 to 3,000, you are at the level where you could comfortably own a house. You could comfortably own a house. You could comfortably pay for a house. Now, remember all these things we have said. You could place yourself even in 0 to 1,000, but you find that it really barely makes ends meet. You have a nice brick house, everything, but no food on the table. We're talking about the level where it will be comfortable to exercise your faith. So if you're about 2,000 to 3,000, you could comfortably own a house after paying all your income tax, tithes and offerings. Then you could go for those uh, either more expensive apartments or a terrace house. Whatever level they are. Set a goal. Most probably, if your income is 2000 3000 you're either living in your own house now, making mortgage payments, or you are renting a house right now. And if you don't set goals in 30 years' time, you'll still be renting your house. You'll still be doing all those things, because you don't have goals. You're just happy-go-lucky. Well, God has blessed me thus far. Yes, but He doesn't want you to stop there. Set a go, own your own house, build savings, and when you're 2,000 or 3,000, you could begin to think of diverse investments. Areas where you could invest into. You could begin to pray to the Lord to lead you. At that level, you could actually own a house and an apartment that you could rent. And perhaps by 55, even if you're earning as an engineer or an architect or whatever, you, I'm sure you do plan to retire too. When you retire, you know, at that level, even if your income remains at that level, you will own several apartments and you could rent them out. Then you have a nice steady income and you could do God's work. Self-supporting. You think that's a nice plan? Pursue spiritual pursuits. But it will not work unless you start planning now. If your income is between 3000 to 4000 same applies as to 2000 and 3000 but you could begin to do more things. You could build bigger savings, you could invest in more things, right? Remember, when I said all these things, it looked very carnal at first. But these are practical advice that people need to have. Because most people, the average person, when they graduate from university, they don't have goals. All they have is looking for a job. And after they earn 10 years, then it hit them in the head. Hey, I should set my goal. Too late, they lost 10 years. Start young. 3,000 to 4,000, well, that's 
more comfortable, most probably you could you are capable of owning two homes and a flat. You are capable of investing. By the time you hit 5,000 to 10,000, you have the ability with proper investment, with proper tithing and offerings and savings to be a millionaire in 5 to 10 years. If your income is between 5,000 to 10,000, that is net. <coughs> Thank you for the Zamet. Then you would have the ability if you plan properly to be a millionaire in five to ten years. Let's take just one area, alright? Real estate investment. Invest and today's real estate is coming to the to the area where let's say you own about three houses. In about five to ten years time those houses will double. When they double you are already three quarter a millionaire. How do you pay for your house? You rent it. Others pay for it. There's only one area. There are other areas of investment. So there are those who are earning five thousand to ten thousand, and they have no gold still. And if you're earning five thousand to ten thousand, perhaps you started with a uh, uh, primary education. You didn't have much education. Now is the time to go for the expensive courses that are fast, quick, recognized, accredited, and get an education for yourself. Remember, education is expensive. And those good schools, they will be willing to give you a correspondent course and a video course with six weeks or two weeks of uh, in-campus training and give you a degree. Now is the time to invest part of your money into your own education. It will do you good. Your intellectual development. Right? There are a lot of businessmen who are earning 5000 to 10000 and above who have only a primary education and they are happy because they say, I've got money, so what? No, money is not the only thing. They need to train themselves in the things of this life. They, they need to, to be open, be exposed. And let me tell you, there's nothing like being educated, being trained in those areas. There's nothing like having a degree to your name, a master's, a PhD. It's some sort of achievement. It's a different achievement from earning a living. It's an achievement intellectually. You satisfy yourself. You can do it. And from there you begin to expand to your other areas. So you're earning 5,000 to 10,000. Set your goals carefully. You would be able to, to break the million dollar mark in 5 to 10 years as the Lord blesses you and as your goals are found in God. So that in five to ten years' time, you'll be a multi-millionaire. You say, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that as long as you are a lover of God. And learn how to tie, learn how to give your offering. And you could participate in the projects of God. You can have spiritual projects. Yes, there are a lot of spiritual things you could do. I mean, there are a lot of ideas that I have in mind. Right? When the Lord blesses with lots of money, a lot of ideas I have in mind. Projects like, you know, organizing pastors' conference and pay for all of them. Having five four ministers go all over the place and pay for them. A lot of things you could do spiritually when you have lots of money. But we need to set goals in order to achieve those things. Without goals, we will be nowhere. Just remember, you start working at 21, you got 35 years to finish off. Unless you plan to work till you're 90. I don't. I don't. I plan to finish all my spiritual work in 20 years' time. Then after that, what are you going to do? Spend the rest of my time in prayer and on the Word. I, I don't plan to work and work and work and work. No, I plan to raise up others. Set my goals. Finish it off. And then you could begin to pursue other areas and uh, fulfill them. And you could be satisfied like Jesus praying to the Father, Father, I've finished the work which you called me to do. Set your goals. Achieve them. Don't wait for life to come by. Set your goals, right? Matthew chapter 14. Those are introduction. <laughs> Very long introduction. But those are just to awaken you. Because if you don't touch on practical areas like that, you'll be coming to church for 5 to 10 years and you'll never, be, never change. You're always the same. Spiritually you grow, but naturally you don't grow because the church doesn't touch on those areas. We need to awaken. These are just awakening. Those are not uh, necessarily the best plans, alright? But those are just to stimulate your thinking. To stir you up. To realize, hey, we need to set some goals for our family. 
And if your family, you know, each one is zero to five hundred, then band together. And today there are a lot of things you can do. I'm sure you can find brothers and sisters in the Lord whose hearts are needed to yours. If your income group is zero to one thousand, get together with about about three or four of them. And together, buy a house. You say, but next time, what happens if we quarrel? The house will be cut apart. Find a contract. <laughs> right. You say, oh, we trust each other, no need contract. Let me advise you, the more you trust each other, still have a paper contract. Because <laughs> you never know what will happen. Right. But isn't it better if you're planning between now and the, and the next seven years, you're still going to, you're earning between 1,000 to 2,000, you're single and, uh, and your marriage friends are still far away. Get together with some of these others. Buy a house together and those payments you make, 15 year loan, by seven years time you finish half of it and your house value will increase and you own part of it and at any time, you know, you could say, hey, you know, I'm getting married, I'm moving out, how about you guys, alright, my investment is still there, you say, alright, no, we find someone to take over this area and uh, either we sell the house and we all distribute it out and you have a lump sum besides your savings. Things like that, we, there are a lot of things you can do that, that we need to, to realize that goal setting is an important part of our life. And after you have all the money you want in the world, remember, you need to develop your soul and your spirit. We need to be whole. Our soul development, you didn't get education, get an education. You were poor in languages and all you know is how to count money. Get an education. You could be earning five figures, it doesn't matter. Time to get an education now. Go for those courses that are quick, fast and expensive that you can afford, right? I know places that are accredited, you could earn a degree in a year, a recognized one. But you could move very quickly from a degree to a master's to, to a doctorate in those areas. It will, it will be something that you're satisfied with with your life. Not only the ability to make money, but to be able to grow intellectually, to be expand yourself. Learn an area of music, learn a language. Or, finally, most important, last but not the least, your spiritual development. Every single one of you, right here, would surely accept an opportunity where you don't have to think about your income anymore. You have, you have more than sufficient, everything you have, Everything is provided and all you need to do is spend your time in prayer and the word every one of you here will grab it. But to reach that stage, we need to plan. We need to plan to reach that stage where we could be self-sufficient so that we could give our all to spiritual pursuit. I know a family who are not planned. And some of you hearing this say, you know, I wish I heard it earlier when I was young. It's never too late. Start setting goals now in your family. So that at least you could go somewhere in life. Matthew 14. <coughs> Matthew chapter 14. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> we look at Peter walking on the water. <coughs> and in verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening had come, he was alone there. Now one of the reasons why Jesus went up to the mountain to pray, as we realize in John, Gospel of John, after the feeding of the 5,000, was because the people wanted to sidetrack his goal. And I know of people who many times will sidetrack you of your goal. Jesus had a goal and a mission. He knew how much time he had to finish his goal. During the time when he was a child, even when he was 12 years old at the temple, you hear him talking about his goal. He knew what he came for. He knew this life is not permanent. So he set his goal. And here, part of the feeding of 5,000 was one of the outworkings of his purpose. The miracles of God. Now those people wanted to make him king. In the Gospel of John, we read about how they want to make him king. Jesus refused. He went up alone. Let me tell you, when you set your goal, you set them alone with God. We thank God for family, we thank God for everyone, but we have our own goals. My father had his goal for me, but I didn't fulfill them. Wanted me to go, you know, as like all Chinese family, send, send your child, you know, whichever can, through university, it's prestigious to them. And have a good income, and all these things. They think about education. 
So when I say the Lord has called me to the ministry, they think about the ministry as people who live on handouts. They have visions of me dying of poverty. That's a typical person who thinks about the ministry that way. No, there are ministry goals you set. What you want to achieve also. So I, I could not and I did not fulfill his desire for my life. But when I went forward to the ministry, I realized that there is a balance. There are those who move into the ministry who don't balance the natural with the spiritual. They either go all the way spiritual, and in many churches they teach all spiritual, and there's no natural application of God's Word. And for that reason, many businessmen don't want to go to church. You know why? Because in the church, all they talk about is heaven. It doesn't apply to their life now. You come to church, you say, heaven, 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 heaven. It only makes them want to go to heaven faster. When here they say, hey, I got my business problem, I got this and I got that. You see, in an average uh, move of God, in an average church, you'll find more ladies than men. Thank God it's not here. You know what happened? Because the men are busy earning a living. They are asking a question, why should I come to church? Because all they talk about heaven is heaven. And right now I have to think about the family, about this and about that. They don't realize that in this world they could find principles. They could help them become better businessmen, better people out there, better earners of income. When they find that out, that's when the man will start coming to church and then we start worrying about the ladies not coming. <laughs> so here Jesus had his goal, but look at Peter here. It's, although it's an illustration of miracle, but there's an area of goal setting here. <clears throat> All the disciples came, and in verse 20, 26 they were in a boat. Jesus came by, they say it is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I do not be afraid. One of the things you confront when people set goals is fear. Fear, fear, fear haunts you on the left, on the right. People with fear. And I know people who talk fear when you start setting goals. People who give fear themselves are fearful. But there's one guy there, Peter, and he says in verse 28, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come! Now you must envision when Peter got off the boat and into the water, he had his eyes on Jesus. He had his eyes on the Master. He heard the voice, Come! And for a moment of time, he was walking straight towards the Master because he had a goal. But somewhere along the way, the waves were making sound. And he turned to the left and right and he saw these waves. Thoughts come to his mind. When those thoughts come to his mind, he starts thinking about what these waves will do, what will happen. He took his eyes from Jesus. The moment he took his eyes from Jesus, he started thinking. Goal setting is a fixation that you have. You must understand what a fixation is. A fixation is a natural application of visualizing. Where you're so consumed in something that everything else loses its influence and value on your life. The soldier who goes up to battle is so fixed on the battle that even sometimes when they are cut, they are bruised, they are shot, they don't feel the pain. The fixation has a powerful psychological effect. And after everything is over, then they realize they were cut. Some of you have entered fixations on a project, something that you do. When you enter into it, you forgot to eat. You forgot to do a lot of other things. You enter into what I call a fixation. Now, to achieve a goal, that goal has to have a fixation on you. That is why last week we talked about how your spiritual and body has to be in it. Because if you enter a fixation and it came from your soul, goodbye, dangerous. came from your body, it's dangerous. It came from your spirit, oh hallelujah, that's what we want. 
But the people do not know how to, what I call, concentrate. How to have a fixation on those areas. They get easily distracted. The average person set goals that they cannot achieve. They have no ability to launch into that fixation. Without that fixation, you cannot walk on water. Setting goals is like walking on water. Walking on the unknown. Things you have never achieved or known before. Then some others are too easily, what I call, complacent. A lot of the average person, when they start earning $2,000 and they own a house, they think that's all. They don't think about other things to do in life. Other areas to achieve in, developing their very being. Perhaps all their life they wanted to, to learn to be a musician. Now they're in a position they forgot. There's an area that they could develop their life, their department. Perhaps all their life they wanted to go for a mission trip, to do some ministry to the poor, to help the needy, to visit the sick, the lost. Now is the time. Now they could even pay for their own way. There are a lot of things that we need to do in life. We need to have goals constantly. And our main text during this series will be the book of Nehemiah, which we shall start on after all the exhortation and all the emphasis. Our main text is from Nehemiah. See, we have to build ourselves. We took one and a half sessions to emphasize the need for goal setting because the average person don't realize what is involved. Nehemiah chapter 1 came to pass in a month of Cheslev in the twentieth year as I was in Shushan, the citadel. The Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah and I asked him concerning the Jews who escaped who survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. They said to him, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the provinces, chapter 1 verse 3, are there in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now notice what happened. Nehemiah entered into a fixation. He entered into something that consumed his emotions, his energy, his strength, his soul, his spirit, his body. If your goals don't consume them, you will never achieve them. Because only the goals that consume us are we able to and willing to pay the price to have them. So the first part of goal setting is to have those goals so entrenched into you. So deeply move into your life that you're willing to pay the price for them. It was not just for a few hours that he was sad. The Bible says for many days. Goals cannot be set overnight. They must be set over a period of many days in the Lord and sometimes over weeks. Don't think that after you hear this session, you immediately can go back and write down your goals. Those goals are useless. Those are no better than New Year resolutions. Real goals you can set need to be something that you hibernate over. Say, but I'm not bad, I don't go to hibernation. Then we use the word meditation. Real goals are those goals that come to you and slowly consume you. We don't want a fast super rocket that goes up and also comes down. Meteorite Christians. They will also die like meteorites, burn up in the atmosphere. Examine yourself. They are not, goals are not vicious. They are stronger than vicious. They are something that rises from inside you. And those thoughts occupy you for days. Sometime for months. And if you are a sincere Christian and believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you kneel down before God and ask God to search your heart. Saying, God, if those things are not born of you, please remove them. 
But if those things are born of you, please give greater clarity. And you let it consume you until it affects your emotions. Nehemiah cried. A goal that does not affect you emotionally but only affect you intellectually is not good enough. The average goals that people set affect them intellectually. They know what is good for them but they don't want to enjoy that. They don't really enjoy those things. Not good enough. Not good enough to be birthed yet. Keep at it. Keep at it. Keep hibernating over them, meditating over them, thinking over them. And as you do it, get all the information you can on those areas. Because the more information comes, the more you could evaluate your goals before you set them. Getting information is important. Decision making, right? We're going to talk about that in the news, next newsletter. I just completed that. How to make decisions. Making a decision is like making a judgment. Because all decisions involve judgment. Judgment over things. For decision making, number one, get all the information you can. Before you set a goal, before you make a decision to follow that goal. Get all the information you want. Most decisions are made with a lack of information. Or misinformation. Or wrong information. Get all the information and by all I mean everything. Everything you can lay hands on. Every person you can ask. Right? Get the information right. Number two, consult with those who are in those areas. You're thinking of buying a low-cost apartment, find out from another person who owns one or he lives in one. Otherwise, after you reach it, you're not happy. You can't change. Remember, buying a house is like getting married. You're stuck with it. It's not something you can change over and get rid quickly. Right? Moreover, getting married is not something that is, in, that is something you should can get rid of. It's unto death. Big decision, major decision, might better find out from another person. You're intending to get married, find out from someone who's married, what marriage is like. <laughs> and make sure you find from the right guys. <laughs> right person. Consult, consultation. When you consult, remember this. There are a lot of so-called experts who are experts. They don't know much, but they got a lot of advice to give. People who got a lot of advice and a lot of time to give the advice are usually no good. Because the people who can really give the advice are usually very busy. Successful people are busy people. But the unsuccessful people, quote unquote, call themselves successful, have a lot of free time giving advice. They wonder what they ever do for living, giving advice. See, the harder it is to get a person whom you really need to consult with, the more you need to get that person because that's the person you need to get. Because the person knows what he or she is doing that's why they're so busy consult get the right witnesses generally after you've done all those things follow your deepest impression follow your deepest impression not your first impression not your last impression some people think that their first impression is always right not always so when you're in the things of God and you're, you have a very high level of spiritual life your first impression can be very strong but then your spiritual life needs to be maintained. Sometimes spiritually you're more lethargic at times. So your first impressions are the wrong one. Then by the time you pray through, you got your spiritual uh, energy come up, your last impression could be the best. So don't trust whether it's last or first. It's not last or first that matters. It's the deepest. Those things that come from your inward man, trust them. Trust your deepest intuition. They are the best. Guides in your decision making, in your goals. Goal setting. Everyone has whims and fancies that come to them. Whim and fancy for an ice cream. Whim and fancy, you know, to do this, to get this book, to do this, to get your... Uh, okay. To get that clothes, to get this done, to get that done. Whims and fancies. And sometimes they go into the area of 
oh no, I think I just like to, you know, get this uh, bicycle, this uh, motorbike, this uh, house, this uh, car. A lot of those are wins and fancies. No, no good now. Examine them with God, pray before God. And if a goal comes and is born of the Spirit, they will still be there after three months. If after three months they disappear, forget about them. They were just one of your wins and fancies that passes with the passing of the fashions of the world. Not good enough. If after three months, many weeks, those things are still there and they consume you, then you're in the right position for goal setting like Nehemiah. And notice what happens, that fixation enters into his working life. That's what is important. See here in chapter 2, it came to pass in verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I've never been sad in his presence before. Now this was King Artaxerxes, and in those days, if you are sad before the king, you can be beheaded. There is one, one time when it's good to smile. If you don't smile, you can lose your head. Aren't you glad our Lord Jesus is not that way? But I'm sure He would like us to smile more in His presence. And a lot of Christians should smile more. Why? They are too serious. Nobody wants to come to know Jesus because they don't look like that. And it's good to take life with humor. You have less stress. Right? And sometimes I've got to you know, remind those around me when we're on a serious project. You know, I'm serious, but you have to take it you know, with, with, a, with humor and with joy. Otherwise, you get so stressed over it that you don't do a good job. So here is Nehemiah and the king said, Why are you sad? He's, he's afraid. Now, his head is at stake. And he said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lie waste and his gates are burned with fire. Now, Nehemiah was an official cup bearer. He was a professional cup bearer. That was his work and his profession. That was his daily life and activity. The fixation that he has over Jerusalem entered into his daily routine. If your goals do not consume your daily routine and cause you to be dissatisfied with your daily routine as you are, you are not prepared to work them out. So we ask it in a negative way. Are your goals such that they make you unha- uh, dissatisfied where you are? See, we human beings after the fall of man are basically lazy. We do not do something until we are not happy with where we are. It's a sort of negative thing, but that's an aspect of it. Human beings don't stir up the nest unless they have to. I will say that right now, if you are having a good job, a good income of 1,005 to 2,000, you are happy, you are living a nice little flat that you own yourself, uh, we have a reasonable good relationship with people and planning to get married and everything that you wouldn't change where you are now. But if you know that your company is going to close down in a year, I will gather you start thinking. You start goal setting, brother. Because basically we don't want to change until we have to. And so, the application of it is here. Unless your goals make you unhappy where you are, quote unquote. You see, you have to draw the lot, but you have a dissatisfaction. You have a dissatisfaction knowing that you could, 
He could do more, have more, achieve more. Unless your goals cause your boat to rock, cause your nest to be stirred, cause a typhoon to blow through the comfort of your living sofa room, then only are you prepared to pay the price for it. So that gets rid of about 90% of people's goals. The previous one got rid of the 90%. Now it's 90% of your 90%, of your 10%. And you realize how small and streamlined our goals are. That's what we are talking about. Goals you can achieve. So examine them. Have your goals enter into your daily life, your routine life. Consume them until right where you're working. You could be working at a bank, as a bank officer. Your education is HST with a certificate in banking. Reasonably good income, nice bank too, nice colleagues, everything nice. But something is stirring as the ego stirs its mess. Inside you, you know. I won't be happy if this continues until I'm 55. And something is stirring, you've got to do something. You know when to do more. You would rather sit in your manager's seat than where your seat is. <laughs> you're stirring. And now you're prepared to set goals. Then you begin to set those goals. Alright, what do you like? What do you... What does he has that he does, you don't have? Right? That fellow has an education. That fellow has training. That fellow has experience. What area can I have? Experience, you cannot rush it. You have to take time to get experience. But you could get the education that a person got. So you begin to prepare yourself. Say, alright, now let me get information. Let me get all those research done on those areas. How can I achieve those goals? Then you start setting them. And it will say, when you reach that stage, you're prepared to pay the price. And before long, in two years' time, you're right there where your manager used to sit. And for some time, you taste the fruits of your labor with God's great and blessing. You're happy for a moment as a manager. Oh, you're looking around, and after some time, you look around. Something stirs again. Suddenly, this satisfaction comes to you. That's time for new goals. See, God is merciful. He doesn't, he doesn't keep you running all the time. There is time for refreshing. At times when you enjoy, let you enjoy your reward, you recuperate your strength. And after you're recovered, he feeds you nicely. And he says, come on boy, next. And you're going on to the next thing. You keep it up. And you'll be a success in this life. So the dissatisfaction creep in the Nehemiah's routine and daily life. Finally, he was given the authority and the permission to build the walls of Jerusalem. How wonderful. Suddenly, the opportunity of a lifetime comes. You may never get it again. See, you could be working in that bank. And you're praying. Perhaps your financial position is not yet there. So you build yourself up. You could not even afford the cost. But you start visualizing. You start praying. And God has thousands of ways to bring it to you. Perhaps God could bring it so that because of that your performance suddenly increases and is noticeable. And a person comes and we have this special scholarship that is available and you are chosen. Oh, hallelujah. That's better still opportunity of a lifetime. So here is an opportunity that comes. I believe partly it came because of his intercessions and prayer. He's been crying over Jerusalem. Praying and interceding for Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. It consumed him. Something was released into the atmosphere. There is something powerful about seeing things that are not yet here. There's something powerful about a vision. It's so powerful that it will cause, cause people around you to move to fulfill that vision too. A vision is so powerful that if you really have it in your grasp, 
even those you associate with, somehow they may not know about their vision, they will move to help you fulfill it. It's so powerful. It will influence everything you speak, everything you say, everything you do. That subconsciously, people will be moved to help you towards that vision. And the people who should be involved in helping you, who are in a position to help you achieve that vision, are moved to help you to get it because you could see it and visualize it more real than the things that you see around you in the natural how powerful a vision is when you get it inside it. It moves the king. Something he has never done before, but he was the only person on the earth at that time who could help Nehemiah to do that. And God moved his heart. Yea, even the heart and the reins of the hearts of kings are in the hands of God. So the king said, what do you want? The king said, What is your request? Verse 4. Now when the king said, What is the request? Nehemiah knew what to do. That tells me that he has a goal. Because the average person, because they don't have a goal, when they're given the opportunity, they cannot explain in details what they want. Let's suppose that you have a goal. You have a goal to do certain things, to get an education. Your, your income is 0 to 500 and you really want to get an education. Your goal setting and you're working towards that. Suddenly, somebody, could be a company, a bonus, turn or event, your uncle, your grand aunt, Things that you didn't expect. Now, remember I said don't expect this thing. <laughs> Suddenly, you're given $2,000. Because you have a goal, immediately you give your time to offerings, put aside some savings, and you use that money to achieve your goal. But if that money had come when you didn't have the goal, you will take that 2000 and you first of all, you'll be struggling whether to give your time an offering. After you get past that struggle, you're wondering now, what shall I do with this money? 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 All falls off. Squander it here, spend here, spend there. Even though you have $2,000 suddenly come into your hand, it made you no better and no richer. You didn't become a better person because the money came into the hands of someone who didn't have a goal. Perhaps you have a goal that you need $10,000 to $100,000 to achieve. And you're not depending on hands up, you're not depending on charity, you're working towards that goal. Suddenly the money comes, you know exactly what to do. But if you didn't have a goal and supposedly that money came, that same money may destroy you. And I could be assure you, one who has no goals are all, is always a poor steward. But one who has goals is a good steward. So when Nehemiah was told, What do you want? He immediately said, King, this is what I want. I'd like your permission to go on this project. Excuse me from the work of the palace during this time. Let me go and reveal the walls of Jerusalem. And these are the exact statements he made. If it pleases the king, verse 5, chapter 2, if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. King said, How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him, notice he says, I set him a time. To us, in modern terms, he gave the king a deadline. All goals have deadline. If you don't set goals with deadline, you will never get them. If your goals have no deadline, say, someday, someway, I'm going to get an education somehow, you will never get around doing it. 
At the fire, you see it some way, somehow, someday. But when you have a deadline, you think by one year's time, I will do this. By two years' time, I'll do that. Then it's called a goal. When you have an objective without a deadline, it's not called a goal. It's called a wish. A lot of people have wishes. How do I know? Because when I ask them, all right, by when do you plan to have them? They cannot tell me. If they cannot tell me, it's a wish and a desire. A goal is a desire and a wish conceived and planned chronologically. So you must have your goal. Nehemiah gave a deadline. We do not know what deadline he gave to the king. But he says, give me this time and I'll finish that work and come back. That's a man that I know will get it done. When people say, I will do this, brother, I will do that, and they don't send me a time, forget it. I know these people never do. They may take 10 years. Sometimes they will take until Jesus comes. When people tell me, brother, give me two years and I'll do that. That is someone whom I know who will be disciplined and who will sacrifice and who will pay the cost to get it done. So examine yourself. Are your goals actually vicious and desired? They are if they don't have deadlines. I set deadlines for myself. If I cannot reach it by my deadline, say, God, please give me grace. <laughs> and then I, I ask for extension of the deadline. But I put it as a contract. Where extension must be reapplied. And you may pay the cost for it. We have deadlines set. Do you have a deadline? Do you have a deadline when you achieve your educational goal? Do you have a deadline when you move to your low-cost apartment? Do you have a deadline when your family will reach a certain amount of income? Do you have a deadline to move into that business? Do you have a deadline? No deadline, no goals. So with a deadline set, he was now prepared. Now look at verse 7. He knew what he needs. See, if you don't have a goal, you don't know you what you need. If you have a goal, for example, to have a doctorate in five years' time, then you will begin to look at what you need. If I ask you, what do you need? You tell me, I need $1,000.50 right now. Somebody may say, you know, I will help you in this area. And you cannot tell what your need is. Because you don't have a goal. Verse 7, furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governance of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. Now he knows all the official necessities and the red tape, the bureaucracy that is needed to achieve that goal. This is a man who knows his way. Knows how, what he wants and knows how to get it. He cannot say, I, I have a goal to have my own independent business and uh, operate it and uh, no deadline. No planning. It's not a goal. It's a wish. Because if I were to ask you, do you know how to register? Do you know what company you want to register? Do you want it to be a sole proprietor? Do you remember how to partnership? I don't know. Then it's not a goal. It's a wish. What is your share capital? Who is going to be your other partner? Where are you going to establish it? What extent? What product do you want to deal with? If you cannot answer these questions, you don't have a goal. You only have a wish. Because a goal is something you think through, you meditate through, you know the details that are involved. To me, it's like playing chess. Do all the calculations. People don't know. Then when you make the move, that's it. Sometimes people pressure, pressure, do this, do that. Now they think you're doing nothing, but you're doing all the calculations. Before I do an action, I have, you can be sure I have thought through it for days and sometimes months. 
But it may look like nothing is thought about that. Why should why should why should we tell what is going on in our mind? A goal is something that you plan, you know what you need. You know exactly how to go about achieving it. So he knew because he's not gonna come back to the king. Imagine if he goes halfway and then he meets all these governor and they say, Where are you going, Nehemiah? Nehemiah says, I'm going to build the walls of Jerusalem. No way, I'm not letting you pass. What permission do you have? Prove to me what you want to do. Huh? What are you trying to do? Huh? Huh? He goes back to the king after Zexus. Oh king, I forgot something. What do you forget? You know, when a person comes and says he forgot something, and that tells me a person was not a very disciplined person. It didn't prepare, it didn't foresee. A lack of foresight. Then you forgive the person. Oh, never mind. Let me give you this letter. He goes out and then he pays some other thing. He come back. Oh, king. I think after that, the king says, forget it. Come back and work here. That's what a lot of people are. Right? They don't have goals. They only have wishes and desire. Then when they cannot, when they hit something difficult and hard, they come back, back to square one and say, oh, you know, they, they, they have taken leave from their work and they say, oh, you know, sir, boss, and he says, I cannot do this. I, I cannot do that. I got this problem. Can you help me? He says, just one more help, Lord. Oh, one more help. Boss helps you. Give extension one month and then you go and you forgot another thing. And you came back. So sometimes the boss says, I think forget about that. When you come here, just stay and work peacefully. No goals. And Nehemiah, he said goals. He knew what he wanted. <coughs> and notice in verse 8, he asked for some more things. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. Because he knew to build the walls of Jerusalem, you need cash. You need building materials. Now here's a man who don't, don't have an idea. I want to build the walls of Jerusalem. And then you go there and uh, say, I say, I forgot the wood. Can you imagine that? Forgot the wood. Forgot the money. There's people who go by wishes. Why somebody want to go by education? And they say, alright, what field do you want to get educated in? I don't know. Just get an education. That's not good enough. Today's world, there's so many kinds of education you can have. Then you may say, well, this kind, right? Have you got all the information? Have you done all the research? No. Do you know how much it costs? No. They don't have goals. They have wishes. He's a very smart man. That's why I say this man, Nehemiah, watch him. He's a goal setter. He knew what it would cost. And he said, He must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel which pertains to the temple, for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. He even said, I also need a house, by the way. He even thought about where he stayed, which is smart. Because if he goes to Jerusalem, where is he going to stay? He even thinks about all these things and says, Give me enough wood. I'll use the wood to do all these things and build a house, stay there while during those, what, how, how, how much time he took? Six months, a year, whatever. During that time, I'm going to work there and finish the project. On site, he knew what he wants. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. He may say, God is so good, God is so good, but you don't know what you want, God can't give you. And remember this. It's easier to get help if you know what you want. There are a lot of people who really would like to help you. But if you cannot tell them what you want in detail, they will never help you. I mean, most people, if you're, a, you're an average person, you really are a hard worker, disciplined, you know what you want out of life. And you approach perhaps a businessman who has money to spare and he knows you and he trusts you enough and you have proven yourself to him and he says, I need this amount, $119.50 and you've got all the papers to prove it. For this cause, do you help me with this now? 
And I finish it, I get this job, I'll pay you back. The average person who has access to help you would most probably help you. Provided a person knows you, that you're not a con man. Most probably they will help you. Because they know what you want out of life. And they know that you know what you want out of your life. And on the average, they will help you. Later on when you graduate, you came out, you got your medical degree, you came and you said, here is a 100, 1,000 over dollars, plus I have added 20% back to you as interest. Take it. That impresses me. Because that person knows what they want in our life. You can ask any brothers or sisters here who are in a position to help you if you're really among those who are poor. I, I think there are a, a lot of Christian compassion that people do have. More than we think. But the average person who needs help don't have their goals crystallized. So they never get the help they want. They never get it. I mean, if it's, it's a person who needs the, $30 per month just to get through their LCE or their, what do you call it, FRP and SPM now, I think the average person will help me. Because they know what they want out of life and they know this person you give that $30 is going to use it with very great, being grateful to God. Achieve it, become somebody in life and then say, thanks for your help. And say, you don't have to replay, never mind, I still like to. That's the kind of person who deserves help. But the average person who needs help do not have goals. So they're not helped and all they see around is complain. Christians have no love. What do you mean no love? They don't give me the makan when I need it. Why should they give you the makan? I mean, if they give you one makan, you keep coming to them. <laughs> but you come to them and say, I want to go for a course on fishing so that I don't have to take fish from you anymore. They say, well, good. <laughs> What kind of fishing course you want? Which fishing school? Tell me. Show me details. Evidence. Black and white. You say, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't show you all these things. Then I cannot help you yet. See, he has details and Nehemiah came to the king. Got all the help he wants. I tell you, your boss. I, I know a Christian who, who wanted to study law. No, not from here, but he was from Penang. Smart person, but didn't have much income. He has to go out and work at an early age because the parents couldn't afford. He is working for this law firm and he tells his boss, I said, I want to get educated and be a super lawyer. Can you give me off from here to here, paid leave, right, during this time? The boss was very kind. Give it to him. Today he is one of the lawyers in town. Not much, so he is a Baptist guy. But I know him. He knew what he wanted our life and even though nobody else could get those things from the boss because the boss was a stingy boss. But when he made the right approach, knew what he wanted, even the stingy boss get moved. Do you remember the woman who came to the unjust judge? Unjust judge, I mean, he wouldn't even judge the judge, righteous judgment. She came persistently. It's not just a persistence, my friend. She knew what she wanted and she got it. She knew what injustice she was facing. She knew in detail where she was being mistreated, what her rights were. She told the judge, these are my rights. She didn't come and say, Tolong! 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 Judge us, Tolong! Apa? Just Tolong lah! Not good enough. Even the unjust judge will be moved. If you're persistent enough and if you're you have a goal that is detailed enough. You have a deadline and you have an objective that is detailed. We'll continue the next week. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we pray that you continue to speak to our lives, O oh God. In this area, O oh God, as we have different goals in different lines because you have a different call and vision for each one of us. Most of all, oh God, we ask that in five years' time, not a single one here will be the same. Those who hear this word, Lord, whether they are called to the ministry or they're not called, 
But in five years' time, whether they are families, whether they are single, whether they are about to be married, Lord, whatever area, Lord, in five years' time, in ten years' time, may everyone here look back and say, we have set goals from that day forward. And we are not going to be the same. Because we know what we want out of life. And we want to achieve those things that God called us to achieve. We ask for wisdom, Lord, to be imparted upon each one here. Right now, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.